Hi, HRN listeners. We're celebrating our 15th anniversary, and we have a really fun campaign and an ask for you. This 15th anniversary tour is aiming to bring you closer to unique food and music experiences in some of the most exciting cities in America. All the while, we're raising funds to support our work empowering the next generation of food system storytellers through our fellowship programs. Here's how it works. Donate to HRN and be entered into a raffle in the city of your choice to win a dinner for two at a noteworthy restaurant and tickets for two to a concert at a prominent local venue. We have incredible partners in New York, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Nashville, Las Vegas, Charleston, Asheville, and Ardmore, Pennsylvania, who have donated a meal for two and two tickets to a concert of the winner's choice. And all donations help fund our fellowship programs, where we're helping to build essential workforce readiness skills and food system storytelling skills. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15. Thank you. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. HRN is food radio supported by you. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org. Today's program is brought to you by Corin, a supplier of Japanese chef knives and restaurant supplies. For more information, visit corin.com. This episode is brought to you by Wisconsin Cheese. We've been making cheese in Wisconsin since before we were even a state which may be one reason why we win so many awards for it. It's what happens when a whole state dreams in cheese. Find your next favorite cheese at wisconsincheese.com. Hello to everyone. I'm Louisa Kasdan, your host for Let's Talk About Food, a podcast devoted to first-person storytelling where food plays a pivotal, if not a starring role. Everyone has a food story. Food is at the heart of human connection, at the center of love, of ritual, of need and want, and most of all, food creates community. And community is what we crave. Marianne Esposito is a legend. She is the star of Ciao Italia, a PBS show she produces in New Hampshire. Syndicated nationally for 31 years, it's the longest-running cooking show in America. She has written over a dozen books focused on Italian regional cooking, and at 81, she still leads cooking tours to Italy. Fascinating, feisty, and down-to-earth, I just love her. Let's have a listen. I'm always fascinated by how somebody has the self-confidence, has a direction to launch themselves and become this extraordinary presence in the world. Where did that come from? How did it begin? You know, you could ask that question of yourself, Louisa. I do. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I think for anyone, it's a passion, it's a goal. It's confidence that you can do it. Instead of saying no to yourself, you say yes to yourself. Was I scared in the beginning? Absolutely. I was going into territory I knew nothing about. And the TV station said to me, well, we'd like you to do a pilot program for us for your, for Chow Italia to see how that would work. I was petrified because I knew nothing about TV, but I knew my subject. And that, I think, is the box that I stood on. That was my box. I knew my subject. And so could I convey it to a camera lens? I don't know. I had to try. And I think another part of that was the fact that in my other life, I was a high school teacher before I changed careers. Hmm. So I was used to being in front of people. I was used to talking to people. I could do it easily. And so I just used the experience of being a teacher in a past life. Well, I'm still a teacher. I you know, just have a bigger classroom. I can't see people, but they're there. So I really have never left teaching. So I think that that was it. It was the teaching part of me that gave me the confidence. And how did you get started cooking professionally? Or well, uh, were you cooking professionally? Or yes. Did you grow up in a family that I grew up in a family or? of two professional cooks, unusual for women at that time, because my background's Italian, Southern Italian. I had two grandmothers who were in the food business. My Sicilian Mm. grandmother owned her own butcher shop in Rochester, New York, and I would spend my summers with her. 
I intuitively learned about singeing feathers off of chickens and that kind of thing. My other grandmother from Naples ran a boarding house, and I lived in that boarding house. So I was inducted into always helping her make pasta and all the things that she made. Then my mother became a dietitian at a mature age, let's say. She went back to school when she was 50, and she became a dietitian. And these three women really were the foundation for me moving into the food world, because in my very first cookbook, Ciao Italia, which was issued in, I don't know, 1990, I think, I said... And I have it with tomato stains everywhere. Right. And I, and I <laughs> said in that book, if anyone had looked into a crystal ball and told me that I would be doing this now, I would have choked on two meatballs because dealing with food <laughs> was the furthest thing from my mind. I hated the drudgery of watching these women and also being roped into helping these women peel bushels of tomatoes, canning, going to Lockport, New York, and picking bushels of cherries, putting up peaches in syrup, pears in mint, you name it, making tons of pasta, because Abondanza is their middle name. And so everything had to be done in great volume. And I'm sorry to say that, well, maybe I'm not sorry to say this, but believe me, you cannot fall far from your roots, because to this day... I cannot think small when it comes to food. Even if I'm having four people for dinner, my, my first question in my mind is, do I have enough food? Did I make enough food? <laughs> Those three women were influent, very influential, but I put it out of my mind. I wanted to be a high school history teacher. That was my goal. And so I went to college, and I got a liberal arts education. And I did. I taught to high school for a while. And then, I don't know, something happened to me when I turned 40. I made my first trip to Italy. Because when I was home growing up, I was in Italy. Everybody spoke the dialect. We had chicken feet in the refrigerator, things that nobody would eat. But when I stepped outside, I was back in America. Like, I'd go to school with a fried egg sandwich on coarse bread. Everybody else had peanut butter jelly and a hostess cupcake sandwich, a cookie or something. I hated this. But then I made my first trip to Italy. I wanted to go to cooking school. I don't know why I did. Oh, I know what part of it was. There was a magazine that my husband would get, and it was called Medical Economics, because my husband's a physician. And I'm paging through yeah. this magazine. I'm paging through yeah. this magazine, and there's a contest. It says, write an article about something, and if we publish it, we'll pay you $250. Okay. So while I'm in that 40-year-old age thing, I'm thinking about what else would I would like to do besides teach school. So I decided to take writing courses at the university. So I went and I would write short stories and we'd read them in class and all that. So I see this article. So I decide, why don't I write an article about my first trip to Italy, which was in Sorrento in a certified cooking school at the Bellevue Sedin in Sorrento. And I worked under this chef Lorenzo Flus, who was half Austrian. All right, so I'm there, and I decide, I'm going to ask my husband if he wants to come over. So he comes over, and in this class is all women in the school. He's the only guy, and his name is Guy. You know, he's in there, and Lorenzo's teaching us. Something. Fast forward, after I got home, I decided that I would submit a story to this medical economics under his name, because it had to be written by a doctor, but he can't write for beans. So I decided I would do it. So I write this story, and I call it, I traded my scalpel for a spatula. And it's all about him in this cooking class with all these women that were trying to get certified. I submit this thing, right? I still have this magazine. I submit it. And lo and behold, about a month later, I get a letter that you won. <laughs> Guy won, but actually I won. And on the cover of the magazine is a physician with ready for surgery with a fork and knife and a chicken sitting up in front of him. So, <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> so that just kind of spurred me on. I thought, well, <laughs> maybe there's something here. Then I stayed in Italy, and I would go back and forth to Italy Every year. I've made now, I want to say I've made like 60 trips to Italy. I've been in every region. 
I now take groups to Italy so that they can have the experience of working with regional ingredients and because there is no such thing as Italian food, there's only regional food. I have stressed this for 30 years on my show. But anyway, that's where I got my training. And at each time I was in a different region of Italy in a different school because I said to myself, I don't want to go to the CIA because you know why? I'm not going to learn anything about Italian regional cooking. If anything, I'm going to get a smattering of this. And here's how you make a ragu. Here's how you make a bechamela. Here's how you make pesto. Good luck. That is not learning how to cook Italian regional food. You have to immerse yourself. And that's exactly what I did. I immersed myself. So I think you have to be true to yourself. I write all these books, but they're from my experience. I cook all this food. It's because I cook it. I don't ask somebody else to cook it for me. I cook it because I want that experience of being able to give you, the reader of my cookbooks or the viewers of my show, the yes, the do's, the don'ts. It came out great. It came out lousy. I'm the one who will know that, not someone who wrote this for me. So it's been a wonderful journey. It really has. And that's how I started. Once I kept going to cooking schools, my husband says, why don't you go to the university and see if they would like a a little cable show on Italian regional food? Now, you have to remember, I live in New Hampshire. Try to find an Italian in New Hampshire, right? I went to the (laughs) grocery store when I first got here, and I was looking for asso buco. People looking at me like, excuse me, ma'am? We have ground beef, ground chuck. I'm, oh, okay, right. All right, so I write out this proposal. I'm typing this whole thing out, regional cooking. And I take it over to the university. Of course, I expected what I expected. They looked at me like, thank you for coming. We'll think about it. I'm sure it went to the round file. So I went back to doing what I was doing, which at that time I had a catering business and I was teaching adult ed classes in a local high school. When I think back on that, To teach classes at adult ed at night, I had two small kids, a husband who was always on call. There was nobody to help you. You want to do this? That's great. You design the program. You go to the store. You get everything you need. You do all the prep work. You lug this up three flights of stairs with the pots and pans and everything you need to the classroom. You teach the class. They all enjoy it. They have wine. They go home. You pack everything up. You go up and down the stairs again three or four times to get everything in the car. You come home. It's 11 p.m. at night, and your husband says, what the hell are you doing? But it was a passion. I really loved doing it. So, you okay, had the bit I'm doing your all teeth. that. <laughs> and then, about six months later, I get a letter from the university saying, we've just moved into a new studio, and we're thinking about cooking classes. We have your file. Would you do a pilot program for us? Of course, I said yes. I had no idea what the heck a pilot program was. So on a very hot August day, they came to my house, maybe 25 people. I can't even remember. They slapped some makeup on me. They gelled all the windows, took the plug out of the refrigerator, had their little signs about, look here, do this and do that, and think five seconds, don't talk for five seconds, then move this plate over here so this camera can see it. And all the time, all you have to do is say this. You're you're having a nice conversation with the person (laughs) that you're supposed to be talking to. And and in your head, it's all this. Remember, five seconds later, you got to go over here, and then you got to show the food to this over Oh, my God. And my favorite part was the producer saying, now remember, be up, up, up. (laughs) At the end of the day, for a 26-minute program, a pilot program, we started at 8 o'clock in the morning, and I think we finished around 7 o'clock that night. Outside, it was al fresco. This was the whole gist of of that pilot program. I was exhausted mentally and physically. (laughs) My husband, of course, sees nothing of this because he's in the hospital taking care of people. He comes home and goes, how was the pilot? I said, Guy, this is too mental. It's too physical. It's too long, and I'm not going to do it. Okay. The university says, thank you very much. Goodbye. And they said, we'll let you know. So what they did was is they took this program and they sent it out on the satellite thing to see what kind of reaction it would get. They were happy with the reaction it got. And they said, do you think you you might want to try doing 13 shows for us? 
I, I was like, what? <laughs> okay, okay, yeah, sure. So I truck over there to the studio. Again, remember, I'm the only Italian in New Hampshire at that point. <laughs> so, you know, nobody understood the language that I was talking. But I, I certainly was able to work with people from all different backgrounds. And they built me a studio. And, of course, we had no running water thing. As you know how a kitchen studio is, is it's, it's, it's yeah. very fake. And we did 13 shows, and they sent it out in the second year to PBS to see if PBS would pick it up. And they did. And I think part of it was because I was in the right place at the right time. People were starting to hear a lot about the merits of extra virgin olive oil. This is good for you. It's going to lower your cholesterol. You have to follow the Mediterranean diet. This is the diet that's going to help you live longer. That was in people's consciousness then. It started to all come together. And then there's me talking about Italian regional food at the same time. So I think that was part of it, that, that, that it, there was an interest, that the interest, I had sparked the interest in that. And so that's how Ciao Italia was born. And the second season it was on PBS, it went national. And so it became the only national show that the television station here in New Hampshire ever produced, which was Ciao Italia. We're in pre-production for our 31st year. People say to me, what else is there to say about Italian regional food? Believe me, there is a lot to say about Italian regional food because if you know anything about the history of Italy and its regionality, it's a treasure trove. You will never discover it all. I will never discover it all in my lifetime. But, and, and so that's what makes it so wonderful, that, that, that there's such a treasure trove of things to be discovered. <laughs> so it's an incredible story. Serendipity, but not really. <laughs> a lot of drive, a lot of passion. Yeah. So when you are... So 31 years is pretty incredible. It's a long time, yeah. Do you still love it? Do you still, when, oh, you, when you're in front of the cameras, absolutely. tell me how you feel. Absolutely, I still love it. I just think of the camera as a, a friend is in my kitchen. And I'm just talking to you about maybe something new that I discovered. Recently, I took a group to Rona and to Trieste. Now, now a lot of people don't go to Trieste in northern Italy because they're going to the big three, Rome, Venice, and Florence, and that's what they know. But there's so much more to know, and I get very excited about the foods of all of these various regions. So we're in Verona, and I've got a group of 22 people. And what I do with them is I take them on a 10-day tour, and two of the out of the 10 days are used for them to work with regional, local ingredients in season. And we are in a certified cooking school in the region. They have to make this menu, and then that becomes their lunch for the day. So they learn about the ingredients, where, why they are particular to that region, and that kind of thing. So one of the things we were going to make for dessert, something called torta russa, di Verona. So Totarusa translates to Russian cake from Verona, a Russian cake. So I usually arrive on these tours a couple days ahead of time so I can scout out everything. So I'm in Verona and of course everybody's going to Romeo and Juliet, kiss the Juliet's breast and all that stuff. Okay, I'm over that. So <laughs> I'm searching for a pastacheria, a pastry shop, where I can see their versions of the tortarusa, because, of course, we live in America, so we have to adjust the ingredients to what we're doing. So I walk into this place. I see a big pandoro in this shop window. Pandoro is what the Veronese have as a Christmas bread. It's like an eight-starred bread made in mold, and it's comparable to Milan's panettone. This is Verona's Christmas cake. I see it in the window. So I go in. I see the signora behind the, the counter. And I asked her, signora, I said, Avete la torta russa di Verona? And she looks at me. I asked her, I said, do you have the Russian cake? She says, no. She says, we make pandoro. I'm thinking, okay, I'm not going to argue with her because she's bigger than me. So I said, thank you. I come out of the shop and I said, guy, she's wrong. She should have the torta russa di Verona. I said, there's got to be a pastry shop here that has, because I do my research. I do my research about these things. It's not just that, okay, let's just make this. 
So I go on the internet and I see that there's another pastry shop, another pastacheria, way down the other end, near the Piazza Bra, which is where they do the operas in Verona. Piazza Bra. Big, huge uh, piazza. So we walk. We're walking like a mile and a half. I finally see the shop. And in the window, on tiered dishes, are all of these Torta di Verona, Torta Russa di Verona. So I go in, I'm so happy. It's like somebody gave me a Christmas present. And I went and I, I said to the senior, and I said, can I, oh my God, I said, can I take a picture with you? And I have all these pictures and everything. So I said, la Torta Russa di Verona non è, non è vecchia. She says, yeah, no, no, it's, it's not that old. It's not an old, old recipe. But it is a recipe that we named a Russian cake because when it bakes... It looks like one of those hats, those Russian hats. That because people, I can. That's yeah. why they called it that. So it's always nice to know the history. So when I got in the class, I said, I all want you to go down to this pastry shop and ask this signora where the Torta Orusa di Verona is, the one that told me in the, in the first place, no, we don't do that. I said, I all want you to go in there and ask for the Torta Orusa di Verona. <laughs> and they did. And she must have thought, what is going on? <laughs> But anyway, it's a really wonderful cake. <laughs> yeah. That's a great story. That is a great story. Yeah. And we'll be back with more of Marian Esposito. Today's program is brought to you by Corin, a supplier of Japanese chef knives and restaurant supplies. Corin is proud of their Japanese culture and traditions, but they want you to know that their products are not just for Japanese restaurants. Their knives and tableware bring out the best qualities of food from every culture and fit into every restaurant from French to Pan-Asian to American. And that is why they're located in New York City, where people from every country in the world come to eat. Corin's Tribeca showroom is home to the most extensive collection of Japanese chef knives in the world, including Japan. Stop by to view their exquisitely designed tableware and the rarest natural sharpening stones. They have a whole range of knife services from repair and rust removal to reshaping and realigning. Corin is dedicated to this ideal, bringing the highest quality Japanese design to your table so you can experience the unparalleled quality of Japanese craftsmanship in your home or restaurant. For more information, visit Corin.com. This episode is brought to you by Wisconsin Cheese. There's a reason when you think of Wisconsin, you think cheese. Cheese is a huge part of Wisconsin's history and future. In Wisconsin, the state of cheese, the tradition of cheesemaking excellence began 180 years ago, before Wisconsin was recognized as a state. Immigrants traveled to settle in this lush, green hills of Wisconsin, bringing their cheesemaking traditions with them. These storied skills combined with the freshest milk available created a cheesemaking culture that is uniquely Wisconsin. Wisconsin's 1,200 cheesemakers, many of whom are third and fourth generation, continue to pass on old world traditions while adopting modern innovations in cheesemaking craftsmanship. Find your next favorite cheese at wisconsincheese.com. And we are back with Marian Esposito of Ciao Italia. You're taking, and who's your audience? When you're looking at the, into the camera and you're taking people on the trips, who are you imagining is sitting there listening to you? Well, I'm just imagining that it's someone who just loves food. I'm not imagining that it's a certain demographic. I'm, I'm not thinking it's grandmas watching me or teenagers, although I have Our demographics show that we have all of these people in different age groups that watch Chow Italia. Even cats and dogs watch Chow Italia because people send me pictures. They take a picture of me on the TV and they're sitting there with, and she says, look at my cat even likes this show. I'm just talking to you. I envision that it's you. I'm just talking to one person at my kitchen table. That's how I like to come across. So what happened over the first couple of years? Did you feel yourself getting better, getting into the groove? Oh, my God. I don't even want to see the first seasons. (laughs) Oh, no, 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 no. The first two seasons, I think you're getting your sea legs. You know that you hit your stride 
when it's just very seamless. You're relaxed and you're just going through the whole thing and you're telling a story. A good example of this is the day that I decided to do a show with black truffles. I called up the Urbani Truffle Company on Long Island in New York, and I said, this is a public TV show, so we don't have a lot of money. I said, would you mind if we asked you to donate and we'll do some truffles and we'll give you a thank you in our credit roll? They were very accommodating. They said, oh, absolutely. So they send these precious black truffles, right? They come in a little box. It's like a ceremony. I put them in the refrigerator, and we're getting ready to do this show. Now, we always do what's called a walk-through, so cameras know where to be. Now, that this is years ago. Now it's all different. We don't need those big honking cameras anymore. So I'll walk through with the crew, and I'll say, well, I'm going to go to the refrigerator at the beginning of the show, and I'm going to get these truffles. I won't talk for five seconds. When I get to the center of the counter, that's when I'll talk. I'll put the truffle here in front of, to the left of me so the camera can get the shot of the truffle, blah, blah, blah. So the, they, they anticipate where you're going to be. Okay. So we're ready to roll. The truffles are in the refrigerator, and we start the show. Now, usually we only do one take, one, because Impressive. time is money. And this is public television. So put the truffles in the refrigerator. And I hear five, four, three, two, one. And so I introduce what I'm going to do. And now I march over to the refrigerator. I open the door. I get the truffles, bring them to the center of the counter, exactly where I said I was going to put them. Okay. Now I'm starting to tell you about how black truffles are used in Italy, where they come from. And all of a sudden, I hear, stop, stop, stop. And I thought, what? Did I say something I shouldn't have said? They said, go back to the refrigerator. I said, you mean you want me to put the truffles back in the refrigerator? No, no, no. Just go back to the refrigerator. I had no idea what they were thinking of. I go back to the refrigerator. I open the door. And on the middle shelf, I am not kidding you, is a mannequin head this big. And I never saw it. That's how zoned out I was. And they were trying to play a joke on me. They expected me to open the refrigerator and go, ah, oh, my God. <laughs> but I didn't. I opened the refrigerator. I didn't even see the head. It's big. I pick up the truffles, and I go to the center counter. So when I saw it, I thought, oh, my God. <laughs> but see, that's what you have to do. You have to be in be that so zone. And I was, because I never saw the head. (laughs) So, for example, now, when you're recording an episode, and the episodes are a half hour or twenty, They have to be 26 minutes. 26 minutes. Now it takes you how many hours to do 26 minutes? Oh, gosh. How many hours to do 26 minutes? No, To film it. It it takes uh, maybe a couple hours. That means... The crew's in place. They've checked the cameras. The kitchen staff is here. They've got the swap outs ready to roll. But really, these episodes take a year of planning because now I'm planning these for this summer. I know what I'm going to cook, but now it's like talk to all these people, make sure you have all these these ingredients, who's going to supply this, who's going to do that. What's gotten easier is, as I said a little earlier, the cameras. Now we can do this on very small cameras. We don't need a big studio. So we eventually, my producer said to me, we're going to get out of the studio. It's not real. Well, yeah, right, it's not real. We're going we're gonna to just cook in your kitchen. I went, you what? Oh, yeah, because your kitchen is real. That's a real kitchen. So we did that. For three seasons, we cooked in my kitchen. It was okay, but you didn't have a life because everything was upside down, moved around. You couldn't, you had to walk about around cables and lights and all this. I didn't like the fact that it was in my own kitchen, but people loved it. They said, oh, is that your kitchen? Where did you get that plate that's hanging on the wall? I'd like to (laughs) just, so now we do more in the world kinds of kitchens on location kinds of stuff, but I still do a few episodes where I'm in my kitchen or I'm in a cooking school somewhere. Like for our 30th season, we filmed 
our series in a cooking school in Salem, New Hampshire. It was called La Scuola Culinaria, and it was in Tuscan Village, Tuscan Market. The owner there is from Sicily, and he had a beautiful, designed a beautiful kitchen. So I approached him and I said, Joe, I said, how would you like it if we'd filmed our 30th season in this kitchen in front of a live audience? I think you always have to start reinventing yourself. So we decided to do this in front of a live audience where they could ask questions as I was cooking. So that added another dimension to this. And he said yes, and that's what we did. We did our 30th season. What I didn't envision was that even though these people were there and they could ask questions, some of them were just petrified to ask a question. So then... As we were going along, I decided tomorrow I'm going to ask one of them to come up here and cook with me so that they can see it's very easy to do. It is nothing to be intimidated about. So I started adding the participants to cook with me, and they loved it. So that was something that we did that was different. What is it, what are the skills, I mean, in 31 years of teaching people, longer than that, Yeah. what are the skills that again and again you find that you have to teach? You mean in terms of cooking skills? First of all, you have to teach knife skills. That's number one. How to use knives, how to use the correct knives, make sure that you know how to sharpen knives. That's really important. Second thing is you have to know how to prep and in certain kinds of steps. And you have to learn how to do more than one thing at the same time. Now, I learned that at a young age because I was immersed with all these three women, as I tell you. But I can cook three things at once because I'm so used to doing that. So you have to be organized, number one. You definitely have to be organized. So I can make soup and chop up vegetables for a salad and maybe get my dough going for a semolina bread at the same time. A lot of people find that very difficult to Mm -hmm. do, very difficult to do. I think developing that ability to be able to do two or three things at the same time, which is if you're in a restaurant, man, you better know how to do this kind of stuff, right? And knowing how to treat the ingredients that you're working with and always using things that are the freshest that they can be. I know that people like to take shortcuts, but really, it's that's not me. I'm the from scratch cook, and that's where my mind always is. I'm not one to do like a lot of convenient types of things where, you know, I want a a jar of tomato sauce or something. That would be anathema to me. So because I, I, you know, I think I want to say to people how easy this is to do. And when I see their grocery cart full of all this junk that they're bringing home that has lots of salt, I want to tap them and say, you know that jar of tomato sauce you got in there? You know what's in there? Or that little green box of Parmesan cheese you're buying? Oh, my God, it's full of sawdust. It's wanting to do it, number one, and knowing what your limitations are. If you're not good at pastry, well, forget that. Concentrate on something you're good at. Maybe Maybe you're good at making stew or you're good at pies or something. But, yeah, know what your limitations. Me? I I love French pastries, and I have made croissants from scratch, but you got to stay home for three days to do it. So right. I that's one thing I'll just I'll say to myself, okay, I'm going to give in, I'm going to give in, I'm going to go to the pastry shop and I'm going to buy <laughs> croissants. I remember one day, my son Christopher loves tomato soup, and I always make it with our garden tomatoes. So he's visiting from college, and I have no tomato soup. And it's wintertime. So I decide, okay, I'm just going to, I'll get up at 7 o'clock in the morning. I'm going to go to the grocery store. Nobody will be there. And I'm going to get a can of soup. Well, forget it. So I'm in there. 7 o'clock in the morning. I'm reaching for the can of soup. And I hear, you're not buying soup in a can, are you? <laughs> you know? just, I just, yeah, you got to live what you preach. So <laughs> that was funny. Yeah, that is crazy. Well, that's a lot of from scratch. It is. And, but we this is how yeah. we cook every day. 
every day we cook from scratch and we cook with what is in season. Now the garden is laying dormant right now, but in the freezer, right. we it, it, at the end of the summer, I took all of the beans, the zucchini, the, the squash, the eggplant. I chopped all that stuff up. It, it became okay. minestrone soup. So we froze a lot of that stuff. So we do a lot of that in the summer when everything's here, we get it all ready for winter. So then we have it. And then we supplement with what we need from the grocery store. Like yesterday, I made artichokes. I did a little video for our Instagram people because they look at an artichoke and they think, oh my God, this is a weapon. What do you do with this? I start thinking about things now. I think it's getting to be spring, only 28 days away. Artichokes are something that you find that are, are fresh in your store now. Artichokes in the spring, artichokes in the fall. You have to think in that mindset. What's in season? What should I be cooking? Do you have that in your one of the books that sort of says the year, like a life plan. Yeah, in this c current cookbook, I talk about that. I talk about what to plant and what to eat at different times of the year. I'm constantly talking about this on our shows. But what's so fascinating is even after 31 years, I'm still getting questions from people about what is extra virgin olive oil. You just cannot assume that because you've been doing this for 31 years, everyone who's watching or listening to you knows this information. There's always no. They haven't been listening for 31 years. Well, there's Different somebody that's always going to find the, you the new and yeah. say, "Oh, I didn't yeah. know that." Through all of these years, and all of these books, and all these TV shows, do you feel like there's another, there's some other place that you want to get to now? You have so many accolades. I don't think there's anybody whose whose reputation can surpass yours. Where, what's next for you? How do you find another mountain to to climb? I like what I do. I always have another book in the back of my head, and I'm planning the, the shows, so I, I really enjoy doing those and continuing the, to do the uh, tours that I like to do. Yeah. So I would say stay in your lane. It's, it, what else? What, I, what would I do if I wasn't doing something like this? I'd become an archaeologist yeah. because I enjoy anything in antiquity. Anything on ancient Egypt, I eat up or I go to Pompeii or they, somebody discovers a new skeleton, I'm there. I just enjoy being with people and I get a great a sense of accomplishment of teaching somebody something they didn't formerly know and that they ran with. One of the shows I did, The Wedding Cookie Cake, which is this big, huge, towering Italian cake that you see at weddings. And somehow it just clicked with people. And they all wanted that. And to this day, to this day, they send me pictures of the wedding cookie cakes that they, they do. They're just, it's a connection. I think I can easily make a connection with people because I'm just who I am. I'm just normal like you. I don't want to put on any errors or being, I make a lot of mistakes and I've showed you, I've showed you a lot of the mistakes that I've made. I'm not perfect. I've made food that you want to throw in the garbage. I think people relate to that. And so I always say, just be who you are and love what you do and stay in your lane. And that's me. I really feel that I should end it there. <laughs> I think it's perfect. Marianne, can I come up and Absolutely. see you? Absolutely. You're welcome anytime. Live far. We'll make pappardelle together. Great. I would love that. All right. Uh, this is great. I'm going to love this. I have been cooking from Ciao Italia for like 20 years. Yeah. It's a great book. Thank you so much. It's so fun to talk to you, though. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it was great. All right. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you. You too. Thank you. Bye. Ciao. Ciao. <laughs> Ciao. Thank you, Marianne. This was just great. Love your books. Love you. Hope to see you soon. Thanks for listening. Let's Talk About Food is produced by The Food Voice. I'm producing, along with audio director and composer Mike Moss of Soundscape Boston. You can find more of our stories at our website, letstalkaboutfood.com, and on Heritage Radio or wherever you get your podcasts. Let's Talk About Food is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. Keep in touch at heritageradionetwork.org slash subscribe.
Hey there, I'm Lee Ullman here with some big news from the National Young Farmers Coalition. We're partnering with Heritage Radio Network on a special season of The Farm Report. It's all about what's happening with the Farm Bill and how it impacts farmers and eaters. I am growing diversified vegetables on land that's been in our family for 150 years. And so with the pandemic, gentrification, property values going up, we had to sell the land and we lost it. Join us as we uncover the untold stories behind this massive piece of legislation that shapes how we grow our food, what we eat, and so much more. The problems we have had, those are things that come from earlier Farm Bill and USDA policy, right? Like Earl Butts, get big or get out. You know, it's my responsibility to know not only what I'm eating, but then like how, how that all came to be and realize like, wow, like this piece of legislation, all this money, like it's technically something that I support as a taxpayer. While Congress debates the next farm bill, this is not just an invitation to listen. It's a call to action. Be part of the conversation. Subscribe to The Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network wherever you listen to podcasts.